I think how I'd like to structure our conversation today is if committee members, while Maria is walking through the bill, if you would kind of, uh, you know, take notes uh, with your questions, priorities, ideas as we go through this. Um, and then after uh, Maria has walked us through the bill, let's, you know, as if we were sitting in our committee room, let's uh, spend some time, maybe a couple of minutes per member um, to go through, again, your questions, priorities, ideas, things that struck you in the bill, things that aren't there that you would like to um, see us um, add at this point, just, you know, kind of a comment time so that we can, um, you know, kind of bring people's thoughts together. I think we're gonna have an extraordinary amount of work to do in the next, um, as I said earlier, in the next weeks, not months. My, um, my hope is that we can move on this bill quickly and aggressively. And um, there are other committees in the, uh, in the House that are gonna to have to work on this before we even think about sending it to the Senate. So um, I'm excited about this and um, rare to go. So again, thank you, Maria, for, for all the work you've done so far and thanks for walking us through. Do you have co-hosting uh, capability so that you can pull the, pull the, I think the document is posted on our website, although I haven't looked. I believe it is. It is okay. posted, Tim. Yeah. Okay, great. So take and it away, Maria. Matthew, you. Great. I'm um, excited to do that. Maria Royal with Legislative Council. Uh, let's pull this up and get to the beginning. So, is that visible and a large enough font for you to all see clearly? So I can see it, Maria. Um, you know, we can only see, I think, seven or eight lines at a time. But, you know, the, uh, is that as big as you can make it on, on the screen? If it is, that's fine. You mean you want a no, smaller no, 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 no. font so you can see more on the screen? Or do you want it? More of the screen. It, 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 was, it was fine how you had it before. We could only see seven lines of the, of the text. Oh, I... I don't know why that is. Um, that, that's Matthew, a do you have enough? Does this work for other members? Good. Okay. You know, we're getting a special training ledge council next Monday on sharing presentations on Zoom. So I'm going to get much better at this, I promise, okay. Okay. as the session goes on. So. Um, okay, uh, so we'll dive right in. There are about 60 sections to this bill. Um, some of them have many um, amendments uh, within each section, and some of them are still kind of in the to-be-determined stage. So we'll address each one of those. Um, and I think the chair actually did a great job setting the stage in a way that's very consistent with what you have before you in the first section, which is the findings and intent section for the entire committee bill. And I don't, maybe I'll, I'll go through these um, kind of quickly just to set the stage with the understanding that as you develop your work and hear testimony, they may be refined um, uh, and revised based on what you hear but we'll go through, it kind of addresses what Vermont has done to date at a high level, um, and then what some of the, the newer issues are that have come to your attention um, this year. So with that, uh, the first finding for over a decade, Vermont has pursued many approaches and strategies designed to ensure that every Vermonter has access to reliable, affordable, high-speed broadband. In Act, or uh, in 2018, in Act 169, the General Assembly found that broadband is essential for supporting economic and educational opportunities, strengthening health and public safety networks, and reinforcing freedom of expression and democratic social and civic engagement. We further found in Act number 169 that the lack of a thriving competitive market in Vermont, particularly in isolated locations, disadvantages the ability of consumers and businesses to protect their interests efficiently 
and we recognize that the state may exercise its traditional role in protecting consumers. Then in 2019, through Act 79, the General Assembly found that despite the FCC's light touch regulatory approach under Title I of the Federal Communications Act, rather than utility style regulation under Title II, existing broadband providers are not providing adequate service to many rural areas where fewer potential customers reduce the profitability necessary to justify network expansion. Accordingly, reaching the last mile will, will require a grassroots approach founded on input from and support of local communities. Existing broadband grant programs do not offer the scale to solve this problem and traditional capital sources typically shy away from businesses with limited revenue history and little equity or collateral. Oops. Six, to this end, public investment in programs and personnel that provide local communities with much needed resources and technical assistance is required. In 2020, the COVID-19 public health emergency served as an accelerant to the socioeconomic disparities between the connected and the unconnected in our state. Vermonters who cannot access or cannot afford broadband, many of whom are geographically isolated, face challenges with respect to distance learning, remote working, accessing telehealth services, and accessing government programs and services, including our institutions of democracy, such as the court system. Indeed, the ongoing public health emergency has highlighted the extent to which robust and resilient broadband networks are critical to our economic future as a whole and provide a foundation for our educational, healthcare, public health and safety, and democratic institutions. Nine, broadband infrastructure is critical infrastructure fundamental to accessing other critical services in sectors such as energy, public safety, government, healthcare, education, and commerce. The goal of universal broadband needs to be elevated as the top priority of the state to meet the economic health, safety, and social needs of Vermonters. Oops, sorry. While private broadband providers have brought broadband services to many households, businesses, and locations in Vermont, significant gaps remain. When existing broadband providers fail to achieve the goal of providing reliable, high quality universal broadband, it is imperative for the state to support and facilitate the construction of broadband infrastructure through financial and other means. Communications union districts, CUDs, were created by the state to coordinate and implement creative and innovative solutions in their respective territories particularly where existing providers are not providing adequate service that meets the needs of their residents and businesses while ensuring public accountability. CUDs are thus positioned to be the unofficial provider of last resort for broadband and ensure public accountability for serving all Vermonters within their respective service territories. Yet CUDs have limited access to financial capital necessary for expansion of broadband to unserved and underserved areas of the state. Oops, I don't know why that happens. 15, all Vermont electric ratepayers are supporting the rollout of clean energy technologies. However, not all ratepayers are able to access those technologies because they do not have access to adequate broadband. Equity in the energy sector requires universal broadband. The Department of Public Service simultaneously plays a regulatory role in the telecommunications market while also supporting the development of CUDs in an unregulated competitive broadband market. To ensure broadband in Vermont, there is a need for greater coordination of grassroots broadband solutions both among the CUDs themselves and also with respect to their other potential partners, such as electric distribution utilities, nonprofit organizations, federal government, and private broadband providers. 
that concludes the findings. Then the intent section in subsection B, therefore, this act is intended to protect the public interest by ensuring broadband availability to all Vermonters and Vermont addresses. I'm missing a semicolon. And two, ensuring public accountability for maintaining and upgrading critical broadband infrastructure. Three, increasing the reliability of the electric grid and ensuring equal access to clean energy services among all electric ratepayers. Protecting Vermonters privacy and unrestricted access to the internet. Alleviating the inherent tension the Department of Public Service currently experiences as a result of its dual roles as both regulator and community project developer. Directing public resources to the development of public broadband assets intended to provide universal access. Oops. Seven, developing favorable taxing financing and regulatory mechanisms to support communications union districts. And finally, eight, providing time limited leadership for coordinating the build out of Vermont's communications union districts and their partners and for developing financing mechanisms to fully support that build out through a newly created state entity, the Vermont Community Broadband Authority designed specifically to effectuate these purposes. So that's a lot to digest, I realize. Um, and again, I'm sure we'll return to these and refine them as you um, continue to take testimony. So, um, moving on to the first substantive provision in section two. Um, as the intent section noted, uh, the purpose of one of the purposes of this act is to create a new authority. It's called the Vermont Community Broadband Authority. And we'll just go through um, this first section. It's a new chapter, chapter 91A of Title 30. And uh, the very first section kind of dresses the overall policy findings and purpose of this chapter. And I'm just gonna pause for a second and ask the chair kind of to get a maybe a sense of the level of detail for each of these. I don't wanna just feel like it's uh, not helpful for me to read kind of a word by word um, description, but what do you think is most helpful? Yeah, right I agree with that, Maria. Um, I, I mean, clearly uh, these portions of the bill, you know, kind of the substantive policy portions, I think you should feel free to, you know, to go through and touch on the substantive points here as okay. to, um, you know, what the, what the action is, so to okay. speak. Okay. Um, and I, I mean, I'm reading along with you, obviously, if there's something that uh, I think we should pull out to highlight, I certainly will jump in. Okay, great. Um, and my internet connection looks like it's a little bit spotty, so I will call in on my cell phone if I need to. Um, so with respect to this new authority, I mean, you will recall that right now in dormant status, you have the Vermont Telecommunications Authority, which was created in 2007 uh, to help build out broadband in the state. It went dormant in 2015, and some of its authority was transferred to the Department of Public Service, which is why the department now is ministering, for example, the grant program, the connectivity initiative, and engaging in other activities. So this proposal would create a new entity. It's similar in some, some respects to the Vermont Telecommunications Authority. I would say one of the most notable differences is that unlike the VTA, this new authority does not have bonding authority. It cannot issue revenue bonds to support uh, broadband deployment. So if you happen to be looking at um, cha chapter 90, uh, 91, of Title 30 and you go through the VTA provisions, you'll notice that all of those financing bond related sections are, do not appear here. It does all, 
uh, track a lot of what is in the VTA, but not everything. And um, this proposal drew on some other models in the state. So that being said, I'm probably saying more than I should, but I just wanted to point out you know, that big distinction for those of you who are familiar with the dormant VTA. So the primary- I think that's helpful yep. background, Maria. I, okay. I think that is helpful to, to, so thank you for that. Okay, great. So, you know, you'll see in the policy um, statement in subsection A, and, I, and again, I'm, don't, don't worry, I'm not gonna read word by word, but I do think this is important because this is a policy for this whole chapter here. The policy of the state of Vermont, it is the policy of the state of Vermont to support and accelerate community efforts that advance the state's goal of achieving universal access to reliable, high quality, affordable broadband, the emphasis on community. Um, I'm not gonna read through all the findings here, but this is really a general statement of what the chair is opening comments that so far based on all the strategies, based on federal policy, what the private market has been able to do, there are still significant gaps and at the local level through communications union districts, there has been a lot of activity to address these gaps. And it is those CUDs who um, deserve or warrant under this proposal, uh, support of public resources and uh, greater coordination and leadership through a new state entity. Um, I probably should have just read it because I think I, I spoke longer than it would take to actually read that, but in any event, so the purpose is creating this new authority to accelerate, coordinate, facilitate, support, accelerated community broadband solutions. So no real need to go through the definitions. I think they're all what you would think they mean, um, what you would and expect they mean. Uh, the authority is obviously this new authority. That will, authority comes up in another section as VITA. That's not what we're talking about here. The board is this new board of directors, uh, which we'll review um, in the establishment section. The connectivity initiative is the existing grant program that the department administers now. The department used here is Department of Public Service. Division is Director Purvis's division for telecommunications. There's a new special fund that's created here into which any monies can be deposited. And then the other thing that I did, um, I'm just gonna highlight is uh, in terms of definitions of underserved and unserved, sometimes those terms are used and they're not always defined. They are defined under the connectivity initiative. So we'll be looking at that section in greater detail, but that's um, for now, that's kind of where uh, those terms are defined and this will hopefully add to some consistency in all of your programs so that people know where to look when they're using those terms, who's covered. So uh, with respect to the authority, it's a body corporate and politic. It's an instrumentality of the state. It uh, performs essential government functions. It's a public entity. And in performing its uh, duties, it's subject to state laws such as the open meeting law, um, et cetera. So this is not unlike other um, provisions we have for establishing state entities and describing what their authority is. With respect to the power of the authority, it's exercised through a board of directors. There are 11 proposed members, two ex officio members. Those are the Commissioner of Public Service or designee and the Secretary of Commerce and Community Development. Then there are the rest of the members are public members, three of whom are representing the CUDs and they are selected by the Vicuda, Vermont Communications Union District Association, four public members appointed by the governor who may not be employees or officers of the state at the time of employment, appointment, uh, one public mentor, member appointed by the Speaker of the House who shall not be a member of the General Assembly at the time of appointment, one public member appointed by the Senate Committee on Committees who also should not be a member of the General Assembly. And then when making appointments of public members, the appointing authorities shall give consideration to citizens of the state with knowledge 
of communications technology, communications law and policy, finance, and electric utility law and policy. This is just the subsection D is the membership and the terms, um, maybe reworking a little bit to make sure that they stagger terms, um, reflect what you want. Uh, it allows um, for members to be reappointed, but just to give you a little bit of a heads up, there is a sunset provision for this authority. Um, and I believe it's uh, 2026. So um, anyway, that's just so you kind of know where we're going and something to think about. Um, in terms of, and I see Representative Yantachka has raised his hand. Yeah, Tim, do you do you want us to ask questions as we go along here, here or I mean, do you wait? Yeah, what I, I think I'd prefer to hold them to the end if we can, Mike, because I think there's going to be a lot of questions and we're going to we're going to you know, we're going to go through those, but let's um, make note of them and then let's raise them at the end as well as just right. kind of hear thoughts. So. OK, so maybe I'll uh, give an uh, I've already gone through a half an hour here. So some of this, you know, we'll, you can look at and, and really kind of think through how the chair and vice chair are selected, um, payment of expenses. G, the authority can hire an executive director who's the chief administrative officer. Um, and then the responsibilities of the director, attending meetings, approving accounts, filing, filing an annual report, uh, any other duties required. Then uh, the authority has, uh, may also employ technical expert, experts and other officers, agents, and employees that are necessary to effectuate the purposes of this new chapter. Uh, there was one possible provision that um, is included here for your consideration, whether you want the authority to use the Office of the Attorney General for legal services. That was not in the VTA language. It has been used in other contexts. So it's italicized here um, as something to consider. So then there's creation of a new fund. This is a special fund. What's significant about it is uh, really that any unexpended balances that are in the pun, fund can stay in the fund um, and carry forward to subsequent years. Um, the money goes out pursuant to the policies and purposes of this chapter, um, but it's a repository to the extent the, the authority can um, obtain any grants, donations, whatever, this is where they would go and they would stay there as opposed to being returned to the general fund of the state. So uh, section 8085, the general powers and duties of the authority. You know, uh, if you happen to be looking at the VTA language, I'll just note that um, this kind of boilerplate language here basically means that uh, the entity has uh, all of the authority of a corporation in Vermont uh, to engage in contracting other transactional activities, uh, the right to sue or be sued. Um, so some of what is in the VTA language is actually subsumed by this section. But I would say this is pretty boilerplate. Um, oh, but then significantly, so uh, in terms of its duties, to coordinate and facilitate community broadband efforts and to provide resources to communications union districts in the form of support, technical support, as well as through grants under the Connectivity Initiative and the Community Broadband Innovation Grant Program. So as I mentioned earlier, the Connectivity Initiative, the existing state's grant program that right now is being administered by the department would now be moved to this new authority. Similarly, um, a couple of years ago, you created the Broadband Innovation Grant Program, which actually we will look at in, in more detail because there are some amendments there. This would be fall under the, um, the authority of this new entity. Uh, then some boil boilerplate about receiving grants, accepting grants. Um, three, subdivision three. Right now, the department owns fiber optic assets that were originally 
uh, acquired by the VTA and then transferred to the department. There's a proposal here that those state fiber assets are transferred to the CUDs in which those assets are located. And we'll talk about that again uh, in a subsequent section. Then there's just working with VITA, the bond bank regarding financing, consulting with other agencies and departments regarding um, broadband taxes and fees, whether they should be modified or waived. Um, oops. Assisting CUDs with pursuing route identification for fiber networks and with obtaining poll surveys and negotiating poll contracts, just some general authority. Um, and then this subdivision seven is really identify, publish federal nonprofit, other broadband funding opportunities, you know, an entity that's actually looking for funding opportunities and trying to coordinate them and then assisting the CUDs with uh, completing any grants and loan applications. Aid is just a general provision to uh, do whatever is necessary to care. Carry out the purposes of this section. Flag. This is typical. VTA did not have rulemaking authority. It's typical for many authorities. And it looks like my internet is unstable. Can you still hear me? Okay, great. We can hear you fine. Right. Yeah. So the only question I had about rulemaking. Uh, is maybe when you when or if you want the authority to adopt rules only because it can be time consuming um, eight months typically to adopt rules and as I mentioned earlier this is a, a program that's hopefully going to get a lot of work done in a short amount of time so I'm flagging that issue more than anything. So this uh, 8086, this is the new version of the Broadband Innovation Grant Program that you created a couple of years ago. And without um, going through it too much in detail, I'm just gonna highlight, and, and then I'll also explain for the benefit of some of the newer members, but highlight some of the differences. This grant program was primarily to fund feasibility studies. Um, related to uh, broadband deployment in rural unserved and underserved areas. It was available to, to two years ago to any broad, broadband providers, including up to two electric utilities. It's about $60,000 left currently is to continue the program, but limit it just to CUDs and their partners. Uh, whoops. So that's what you see in terms of eligible applicants. It's just CUDs at this point. So the references to the DUs is no longer here, but they're still required to produce an actionable business plan um, going forward. The grant award is still $60,000. The cap uh, provision for administrative grant management has stayed the same. Um, and you've also left the 12 month requirement for getting um, the studies actually concluded. It was initially six, you expanded it to 12 in the fall um, and you're leaving it at 12 months. Uh, then provisions for the authority to retain the award until the study's completed. <laughs> then, um, reporting back requirements. Uh, uh, the, the authority also reports back any findings and recommendations, uh, aggregated information to the relevant legislative committees. You'll see a reference there on line 17 to the annual report. There's a new annual reporting requirement that's tied to this whole chapter for this new authority. Um, and then in C, just clarifying that this program is the successor in interest to the existing program uh, so that any funds are transferred to this new, new fund, new program. 8087 is just the annual report provision. I think that's pretty standard. Um, and then uh, significantly the sunset in section 8088, July 1st, 2026. 
So that's a broad overview of this new authority and its uh, responsibilities uh, and the programs that it's designed to support. Uh, just some repeals, uh, pretty uh, boilerplate here because it for the existing broadband nation grant program and those are now going away. Uh, section four, this is specific to the transfer of those state owned fiber assets that, that the department has now. So this is a little bit more prescriptive that that transfer of ownership to CUDs should happen on or before July 1st of this year. Uh, there is a provision that should a CUD dissolve that those assets would be returned to the state of Vermont. The proposal in section five, so we'll talk about this in greater detail in a minute um, or a couple sections further down, but uh, what this proposal here would do under the connectivity fund, this is a fund that receives its revenue from the universal surcharge, which all uh, telecom consumers pay um, on their telecom bills. Uh, it's a 2.4% per, 2 surcharge, funds various programs. Uh, I can talk about that a little bit more, but just for so we don't get too far ahead. What this would do is basically right now there's a set aside of the money that comes to the connectivity fund for a specific position currently in the Department of Public Service, which will forever be known as the Rob Fish um, position. Uh, what's proposed here is to one, increase the amount of money uh, that's set aside um, for the operational expenses now, not of the department, but of the new authority, the Vermont Community Broadband Authority. And this envisions that uh, the, the Rural Broadband Technical Assistance Specialist, the Rob Fish position, would be moving to this new authority. Uh, okay, whoops, gosh, let me get better at that. Okay, so I think that pretty much explains that. Um, oh, section six. So you have the existing telecommunications and connectivity advisory board, which advises the department currently on policy and planning and also with respect to grants under the connectivity initiative. So because you're moving the initiative to the new broadband authority, um, at some point we'll have to go in and revise the existing statute. I just didn't have time to do that um, before today, but that's the intent here. Uh, the advisory board would continue in its role in making recommendations on state policy and planning. Section seven, uh, eventually you'll have to think about uh, some funding source or appropriation for this new entity. So now moving on to kind of a new subject uh, somewhat with respect to changes under the existing state grant program, the connectivity initiative. So in addition to this program now being administered by the new Vermont Community Broadband Authority, there are some substantive changes proposed here. So right now, uh, the initiative funds projects that are capable of speed of a minimum of 25.3. That's consistent with what the federal government is doing in most of its programs. The proposal here is you can see on line 20 to raise the minimum requirements to 100 megabits per second symmetrical. So that's a significant change for this existing program. And then uh, also with respect to defining the terms unserved and underserved, and remember these terms now are gonna, these definitions are gonna be the de definitions for all other programs, unless you change them. Um, so what it means to be unserved uh, is not having access to 4.1. What it, under this proposal, what it means to be underserved means having access to 4.1, but less than 25.3. So 
So those are the categories um, that receive priority, the targeted uh, locations under this state grant program. You'll see on line 10, uh, this was an issue that's noted here as to be determined. Uh, there's, there's been some discussion about open access, whether state funded infrastructure should be open access and what the policy ramifications are of that. So I've, that's noted as this is one place where that potentially might be addressed if you decide to move forward. The other um, change here in subsection B, in the existing program under the existing law, the department publishes a list annually of eligible census blocks based on the definitions of served and unserved. Um, I think you heard Director Purvis explain earlier this session, because of the granular data that they have, they actually do it by 911 location. Um, and so this will just bring the statute into conformity with the current practice, which again is more specific than the census block. Um, existing language. So uh, then, so you'll see obviously it's the, the new authority that solicits the proposals. And then significantly, the current program uh, offers grants to any broadband provider under this proposal, only CUDs would be eligible to apply for a grant under this program. Then also what you see on line 16, 17, again, something kind of noted and will be uh, for further consideration by you is whether the, these particular grant funds should be available for capital improvements only um, and not for operating and maintenance its expenses. That's actually the existing law. It's italicized uh, because there was some question about potentially expanding the reach. So no other proposed changes to the criteria that are relevant to whether a grant is awarded. Um, subsection C, not going to go through it in detail, but this is just uh, basically ensuring that the grant funds go out based on the value of a, the work that is completed um, so that funds ensuring greater accountability. Um, subsection D is just a requirement that the authority maintains a publicly accessible inventory of any projects that are financed in whole or in part with grants under this section. So really starting to build up that database of where the state dollars are going um, throughout the state. So the next several sections concern uh, the broadband expansion loan program. In this context, we are now in Title 10 of the Vermont statutes. And when we refer to the authority, we're talking about VITA, the Vermont Economic Development Authority I believe you heard from Cassie and uh, Tad last week about this particular program. So there are some proposed changes in this program. Uh, one, on line nine, you can see uh, that the entities eligible for financing under this program are CUDs. So it's no longer any internet service provider. Um, also, the loan amount, the maximum loan amount is capped, is raised, it's doubled from $4 million to $8 million under this proposal. B is just again clarifying, eligible borrowers include CUDs only. And then under this proposal, so the existing program um, contemplated $10.8 million of, of lending through VITA this proposal increases that amount to $36 million. So with 10% match, that's still required of the now CUDs for their project, that would bring total spending for broadband under this program to $40 million. The current program, the 10.8 with the 10% match was $12 million. 
So a significant increase of lending. Uh, whoops. Uh, subsection three um, basically just adds the Vermont Community Broadband Authority um, as an entity that is consulted with in addition to the department for financing under this program. Uh, the other proposal here in section 10 is uh, one uh, specifying, I think there's some question about whether this was intended to be a revolving loan program or if when the money came back, it was reaped to the state. Um, so this hopefully clarifies um, the intent, at least here, that this is in fact a revolving loan program. You'll see that on line six. Uh, and eliminates uh, the programs that uh, are the provisions that reference the termination of the program. So this is an ongoing program. Um, and then there are a number of provisions and subdivision, new subdivision two on line seven, uh, in terms of what the state's risk is vis-a-vis -vis the VITA's risk. Um, you know, there's an attempt just to kind of extrapolate from the existing numbers, uh, you know, for this much bigger $40 million program, what is that, what would that mean? So instead of $8.5 million risk to the state, there would now be under this proposal, $27 million risk. Likewise, on line 11, the authority would be absorbing uh, many more losses from 3 million to 9 million. Whoops. So two things about the section 11. Um, this is a one-time general fund for loan losses. When you created this program a couple of years ago, and you'll definitely wanna hear from Vita because there are two factors, that two primarily two factors that will influence how much of an appropriation you would want for loan losses. One, how much, how many loans does VITA anticipate writing this year or in fiscal year 2022? And what is its assessment of the risk um, in those loans? So I think when you first developed this program, VITA thought that they'd be issuing um, the half of its uh, lending authority in the first year and then set aside 10% of that. That's what this number is designed to reflect roughly, but you'll absolutely want to hear from Vita uh, and others about what the need and, and timetable might be for these loans. The, then the next sections 12 and section 13, um, along with this enhanced greater lending capacity through Vita, uh, there is a proposal that it has greater, greater moral obligation lending authority for its bonds. Um, that increase in bonding authority comes from the dormant VTA's authority. So that's what you see on line 15 and 16 in section 12, the increase to VITA and then the corresponding decrease to the VTA. Even though the VTA is dormant, it's Bonding authority is still reflected on the state's ledger. Whether these are the appropriate numbers based on a $40 million program, I think you probably just need to hear more from, from Vita on that, but that's that's the intent. So that- Can I chime in here real quickly, Maria? Yeah, sure. Um, just some of this, um, as, as I'd mentioned before, when we were going through how these numbers all play together, and what type of um, commitment VITA might make or what commitment we might ask them to make uh, in this legislation to a larger lending program relative to what the appropriation the legislature would have to make in order to support that um, are, are connected formulaically. And back in 2019, when we stood up this program, um, I think we envisioned that Vita would have lending capacity of $10.8 million here. Yep. And 
what this legislature had to appropriate to support that amount of lending by VITA was a 5% loan loss reserve. So I believe as part of Act 79, the legislature appropriated $540,000. That was a general fund appropriate. I think it was a general, actually, I can't remember if it was a general fund or not. Yeah, it was. was it? Yeah, um, appropriation to support that level of lending. So to, you know, to what you were saying, Maria, if we increase the amount of lending capacity here uh, by VITA, let's say another $20 million, that would require an additional $1 million appropriation just to establish the loan loss reserve to support that level of funding. So um, I just wanted to be clear with members, if we expand this program, there's got, any, uh, there's got to be an appropriation that goes along with it to expand the size of the loan loss reserve. So that's where the appropriations committee would get involved. So. And the other thing though, that I, I did forget to mention, I guess, I guess we'll go back um, as part of that general fund appropriation for loan loss reserves. Um, it's all the, it's similar to exactly to what you did a couple of years ago, except for on line 17. And to enable the authority, VITA, to provide credit enhancements to assist communicate CUDs with securing financing through other lenders. So that's another tool um, that uh, VITA may be able to use to assist. So I just wanted, I forgot to mention that. That's That's new. Uh, oops, God, I'm really bad at the scrolling, aren't I? So then uh, with respect to, now we're, we're talking specifically about CUDs and this is an amendment to their existing authority, um, their chapter of Title 30. And what this is really doing is clarifying um, the confidentiality of their records and information. So I'll just read through it quickly. The purpose of this section is to clarify that any records or information produced or acquired by a district, that's a communications union district, that are trade secrets or confidential business information shall be exempt from public inspection and copying pursuant to, and that's the Public Records Act. Such records or information shall be available for public inspection after project completion. So just a very clear statement of, um, I believe what existing law is. Um, so the next several sections, um, this concerns the property tax exemption for broadband infrastructure. There are actually two options presented here and Abby Shepard, my colleague in Ledge Council, is our tax attorney. So not only should you hold your questions till the end of my walkthrough, but you might want to hold them until she's here on Thursday. Because if I start trying to explain tax law, that may confuse everybody. But I will tell you just big picture the proposals here, what they intend to do under the first option, there would be an exemption from both the statewide education tax, as well as a, a tax at the municipal, at the local level. And that exemption, property tax exemption would be available in two instances, subdivision 19 and in subdivision 20. Subdivision 19 makes the tax exemption available to electric distribution utilities that build broadband infrastructure, provided that infrastructure is leased to a CUD for the purpose of providing broadband service. CUDs are municipalities. They currently do not pay property tax. This would allow the electric company um, to similarly uh, not have to pay property taxes provided it's leasing that fiber infrastructure to a CUD. The exemption would apply prospectively to infrastructure that's constructed on or after July 1st. Then the second instance 
um, would be if a broadband provider, so this could be any broadband provider, um, builds infrastructure and that infrastructure is used for the purpose of providing universal broadband service in unserved and underserved areas. It's constructed on or after July 1st, so prospectively as well, and further provided um, that purpose is affirmed in writing by the Department of Public Service and any affected CUD. So an affected CUD means uh, the district in which the broadband infrastructure is located. So those broadband providers would similarly be able, would be eligible for a tax exemption if it meets all of those requirements. So uh, these next sections uh, basically just uh, fix the other provisions in Title 32, uh, clarifying uh, what I've just read to you. So they kind of all go together as a package. Option B would be uh, similar exemptions offered to the same providers, utilities and broadband providers. What's different here is this would be property exemption and only a property at local level if uh, it's approved by the local voters. So hopefully that is an accurate high level description of the two proposals. And as I said, um, Abby is available to what this means in the tax world and what some of the other tax implications might be or considerations might be. Maria, I, yes. I, I hesitate to even ask this at this point, but it, okay. it is an important, it's, it's an important distinction between these two options yeah. um, in terms of what the, yeah. what the uh, financial effect would be in that um, I believe option A, and I'm gonna ask you to catch me if I fall. I believe option A, um, would provide a full um, property tax exemption for these assets. Whereas if, uh, if um, it was left to local voter approval as to whether or not to extend this property tax exemption, it would only affect the local uh, municipal property tax, um, but not affect the property tax exemption that is paid into the state coffers. That is my understanding. Okay, so I might have screwed that up too, but I, I, let's say let's suffice it to say for members as we go through this, there is a different economic benefit um, between these two proposals. It's not simply the the um, property tax exemption incur, occurs in one with one mechanism, or in the other with another mechanism. They're actually different. The, the size of the benefit is different. Right. Okay, so moving right along, uh, sections 15F, again, these are just corresponding tax law changes. Um, nothing new, nothing substantive there. Um, okay, so then section 16, this is a proposal that's under consideration um, that uh, I think you've kind of heard about. But and Something Maria, I can speak explored. to this since there's, since there's no language yeah, on this, sure. that um, th this really was just a placeholder uh, at, at, at the highest level in that we had heard testimony, I can't remember if it was last week or the week before, um, from uh, um, the, the, the day that Green Mountain Power and Washington Electric Co-op and Velco were in about the possibility of um, distribution utilities um, achieving some cost recovery um, related to pole survey and make ready work that they would do. And um, this was simply a placeholder um, there's no language around this, but a placeholder in the event we decide to, to develop this um, idea more 
Um, I'm sure this would be of great interest to folks in the regulatory community at the PUC and the Department of Public Service, but um, just wanted to put this in here as a placeholder so that we can explore this in the, in the weeks ahead. So that's all this is meant to call out. Okay, um, so section 17. This actually is a proposal that the department presented last spring as part of their emergency action broadband plan. And what this would do, so they can actually come in and, and probably better explain um, the problem that it seeks to address and how it does that. But at a general level, this provision would assist CUDs with accessing middle mile fiber that's currently owned by electric companies. So it's an interconnection um, requirement uh, and designed to give them access to existing middle mile, mile fiber as they build out their networks. And it specifies the process for that, um, whether there are other services, middle mile services available, what the cost should be, how they should be allocated. Um, but again, the idea is to, to serve as one tool that might help the CUDs as they're planning and building out their networks. But the department can better explain how they arrived at some of these proposed fees and schedules and, and allocation of responsibilities for maintenance, et cetera. Then the next section, section 18, this is in the context of telecommunications facility siting under 248A. And what this provision does is simply adds CUDs as another entity. I think I just skipped over it. Yes, on line 18, that received, receives notice of 248A um, application requests. And the purpose is to generally make them aware of facilities that are proposed to be constructed in their service territories. So this actually goes on the existing law for quite a bit. I can probably not include the full statute in the next draft, but there's no, no other substantive changes there. And then another placeholder uh, provision, section 19 concerning workforce development of communications line workers. Something that you may want to uh, include. And your next and I'll just draft, um, yeah. I'll just uh, note for members if if you haven't taken a look at um, our agenda for this week. Actually, tomorrow morning we're going to take a morning of testimony about this very specific topic, um, and it's something that I have learned enough about to be dangerous uh, in the last month or so. Um, but uh, left this as kind of a an open area for the committee to uh, consider as, um, you know, if there's uh, programs that we want to look at supporting um, or even changes to um, existing programs. But this is something that we heard about uh, in recent weeks as a potential um, uh, critical, critical path element that is a constraint on the amount of work that can be done uh, in the state just lacking the, the qualified workers to do this type of, um, uh, to, to do this type of line work. And that brings us to the effective date section. The act is effective on passage. Happy to take questions on that section <laughs> and any others you might have. <laughs> Um, and I will stop the share. Yeah, great. So you can see each other. Super. Thank you for taking us through that, Maria. That was helpful. Great. Um, so as I said at the outset, what, what, I, what would be helpful to me and, and hopefully um, interesting to members of the committee um, in terms of holding off on questions and you know, taking notes, and um, uh, I'd like to open it up just to kind of general conversation now and go, you know, effectively go around the table and hear about priorities that were missed, priorities that shouldn't be in here, um, questions that people had, 
you know, the, the floor is yours. But if, if folks would like to take a couple of minutes to speak to those things, I would welcome um, some thoughts on that now. And again, um, with some of the things that are laid out in this bill, including the, the, the one we just talked to, the, the um, workforce development, um, some of the agenda planning for this week is again to build the committee's um, knowledge and um, provide an opportunity to ask questions and again to dig deeper into some of this policy as we collectively craft this bill. So, um, and, and a, probably the best example of that is the workforce development piece. So, floor is open. Mike, did you want to share your question now? Or? There. Can you hear me? Yep. Yep. Um, okay. So uh, I guess my first question right off the top was, when we're talking about community broadband, are we talking about CUDs only? Or are we talking about uh, uh, broadband that's currently being, um, being built out by other entities like uh, Waysville Champlain Valley Telecom or other... ILX. So I'll take a shot at that, that you know, answering that, but um, I think the focus here is on supporting, um, supporting organizations whose focus is on providing universal coverage. Um, and definitionally, um, that is how CUDs are set up. So a CUD could potentially partner with another entity that doesn't have that as their mission. A CUD might partner with, uh, you know, an ILEC, a, 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 um, a local exchange carrier company like you have locally, I think, in your district, Mike. Uh, we could uh, partner with Consolidated. So it's not that the resources here couldn't only support CUDs, but they would have to collectively support the mission of universal coverage, which effectively means um, partnership with CUDs for 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 th for this funding. Okay, um, I have a whole bunch of questions. I don't know if you want me to go through all of them or whether you want other people to comment on on that particular aspect or not. Uh, well, I don't see any other hands up. So if you've got some thoughts to share, please do. Sure. Um, so the Vermont Broadband Authority that would take over the CUD support functions from the Department of Public Service altogether? In short, yes. Okay. And um, what relationship will the Vermont Broadband Authority have to existing telecommunications providers, if any? Yeah, I, I guess what I would go to is, um, at least again, as the bill is now drafted, um, the community broadband authority would be focused on supporting the work of CUDs. So, um, you know, the end goal here mm -hmm. is to get broadband service to parts of the state that are underserved and unserved and how to best do that. What are the organizations who are focused on that as their mission? And if I, if I can keep going, um, the but best- Actually, part... let me just add as an, as an addendum to that, Mike, sure. that uh, that doesn't mean that private um, internet service providers couldn't be part of that solution, but they would be working in partnership with um, folks who have the mission of providing universal coverage. So universal coverage is key. Okay. Okay. Um, Transferring fiber assets uh, owned by Department of Public Service. Is it owned by Department of Public Service or owned so, by the state? So when the, when the um, Vermont Telecom Authority was set up and ultimately came into possession of, of assets that they developed, and there were a number of assets, they weren't just fiber assets. I believe there's a, I think there's a cell tower in there in central Vermont someplace. I think there's a few other cats and dogs um, and I believe, I don't have the specific language in front of me right now, but I believe what this bill contemplates is the fiber assets. 
um, when the Vermont Telecom Authority went into dormancy, those VTA assets um, went over to, to the Department of Public Service, all of them. And what this bill contemplates is that the fiber assets, not the other stuff, but the fiber assets specifically would, um, would essentially be um, moved over to CUDs essentially. And if a CUD went, um, uh, you know, went out of commission for whatever reason, those mm -hmm. assets would revert back to the state. Okay, isn't, isn't there um, a whole bunch of fiber that's owned by the Agency of Transportation as well? And is sure. that included? No. No, okay. Um, and then the next question I have is the uh, increase from one, 120,000 to 240,000 for the uh, Rob Fish position. Does that mean that there's gonna be two positions? Um, let me do the math. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> well, well, actually, what, what, actually, what it means. Raised. <laughs> <laughs> actually, what, what I, I I was I'm sorry for for being uh, um, for pulling your leg. What what that essentially was meant to mean was to double the resources for that types of type of work. That's not to say that the paid positions at the um, at the community broadband authority would be uh, would be capped at two positions. What it means is that two positions at the um, CBA would come from that stream of funding. Okay. Okay, and then um, with with respect to the Vita bonding authority, it's going from 181 million to 193 million. So I. Uh, I think what I got from Maria's presentation was that 181 million is what the VTA is currently allowed to bond. Our no. beta is currently allowed to bond for VTA or something to that effect. And then it's gonna increase to 193 million. Uh, I, if I don't so, understand, if that's not yeah, correct. So I think, we're, I think we're gonna quickly get over our skis here, but I, I think the important point that what, um, what this draft legislation contemplates is, ex is expanding the amount of lending that VITA can do from 10.8 million. And uh, Maria has 36 million in this draft. It's not clear to me if that 36 million should be 34 million, but at any rate, increasing it significantly, call it from 11 million to mid thirties. Um, so that's the amount of money that, that VITA could lend. And that money uh, is backed by the moral obligation of the state of Vermont. Um, and typically what, um, uh, what we would do in standing up this type of program, which we did back in 2019, is the legislature will appropriate a certain amount of money as a loan loss reserve to support that lending. And in this case, it was determined that that amount should be 5% of whatever was lent. Right, okay. So I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm evading your question. I don't know what the 181 or 193, I don't, I don't know exactly okay, what that reflects. Yeah, I understood the other part. I just wondered about the 181 to 193, you know, what, why the increase there? <clears throat> We're gonna have to have a bonding expert in here to explain those numbers to us. I, I think that's the state bonding. I mean, I think that's the bigger number. Yeah. So. And then my last question, uh, when we talk about uh, the electric distribution utilities, the middle mile fiber, is that is that fiber that's in the electric space of the uh, poles? And how would that, would that access have to be dropped down to the telecom space? Or is that too technical a question? <laughs> well, for me, it is. <laughs> I was going to say, for me also, I don't know if all of the DU fiber is in the electrical space. So, well, we heard that um, some uh, last year. Yeah, it may it may very well be, but it would not be used for last mile fiber. Um, so no service right. drops off of this fiber, middle mile transport. I don't know that that requires moving but I don't know the answer. Okay, all right. 
Hey, Avram. Hi there. Um, uh, just uh, so, uh, some broad comments. Uh, first of all, I, uh, um, there is a lot in this bill, and th this is a, this is a pretty this is a pretty uh, big bill that will do a lot of things. And I'm not immediately uh, finding anything. That you ask, t tell us if there's anything missing. I'm, I'm, I'm not. Uh, I I didn't find. I didn't go. Hey, what about such and such? We may hear from people about things that are missing. I may, uh, uh, at, at this point, I have some uh, word tweaks about things I would, I would say uh, a little bit differently in the, um, in the findings section. I'm not gonna go uh, into that at, at this point, and, but just a, a heads up, the one question I, I will have, and I'll bring it up on Thursday, um, has to do with the, uh, the, the, la the end of the bill with the, with the um, uh, uh, property tax exemption because I have uh, a lot of questions about um, uh, option B or, or where that came from and why uh, why it, it, it's being thought about. So uh, other than that, I'm, this is a lot of work and thank you and I'm sure we're going to do a lot more work and there'll be suggestions coming. But this is this is a great start. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. Well, and I will, uh, I'll insert myself into the airtime here in that <laughs> something that hasn't been identified with specificity here is some of the funding uh, channels here. So there's, there's a lot of work and heavy lifting to do on that. But um, again, that's in front of us. Hey, Heidi, go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. Can you hear me? Yep. Um, <clears throat> So yeah, I guess I'll, I'll first echo um, Avram's uh, thanks for uh, putting this together. It's um, I know it's um, taken a lot of uh, a lot of thought and a lot of work on on your part and the part of Laura. So thank you both. Um, I I will say um, um, obviously we were here, or at least I was. Am I the only one? I don't know. With when the VTA was was in, so I appreciate the thoughts you've put into the um, challenges with the VTA, the failures uh, in my view of the VTA and some other things. So I appreciate the, the thought you've put in when you're putting this together with our experience of the VTA. I will say I would like to hear from some of the incumbent carriers, not necessarily the big ones, as you know, Mr. Chair, I, I have a community that has an incumbent provider that's a really small one, um, but, um, but is good and um, and is committed to serving this area and expanding the service. Um, uh, but it's very difficult, obviously, uh, financially, um, to 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 meet the needs in in the very rural parts of our area. So, um, so the lending and I realize that the partnerships with the CUDs in that way, some of that funding can 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 work for. Uh, with regard to accessing it, um, getting some access through 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 a partnership to uh, to some of these incumbent carriers, but I, I just want to really hear understand some of these smaller incumbent carriers and what their needs are because I know many of them, including the one that I know as well, but a number of them are committed to universal service. Um, but it's but it's um, um, but it's a challenge and, and I wanna see how we might be able to help those as current assets that are parts of our community, important parts of our community with jobs in our community, with investment, lots of investment in our communities and trying to help support and, um, them as they try to expand and again, provide universal service all around. So that's, that's really all. But again, I appreciate all the work that has gone into this and I look forward to all of our work as a committee as we move forward, so. Good, thank you, Heidi. Uh, Catherine? Yeah, thanks. Just uh, first, I wanna start by echoing all of the, um, you know, gratitude to, to you, Chair Briglin and, and Laura for all of the work that has gone into this. Um, 
Now, as we all know, access to broadband has been an essential resource for a long time and COVID has highlighted the, the gaps for so many of our communities and really appreciate the focus in this bill on universal service and accountability for public dollars. We know that the size and scope of this problem is so far beyond just our own limited state resources. And I think in this critical moment, it's essential that we focus on how we can use our, our state dollars um, as strategically as possible to stay focused on that universal service goal. And so pleased to see this effort focus on the local volunteers who have emerged um, from our underserved communities to stand up CUDs to bring that accountability and, and focus to um, universal service. Um, as I mentioned, you know, excited for the conversation later this week to dig into the property tax exemption um, stuff and excited to have uh, Vita back to talk more about the lending piece. Also looking forward to continued conversation about um, open access and the role that it could or, or, um, or uh, play in this moment and how to think about whether we can do that strategically um, without creating barriers for our CUDs to um, advance this work. So. Grateful and I, I, Catherine, I will take that um, note for for the committee and you know any folks who are listening out there in YouTube land. Um, the, the question about open access is a really interesting one to me, and um, I would say as much out of ignorance and concern about unintended consequences, it is something that I'm very much undecided on. It's something that I really am interested in testimony and and learning more about you know, what can go right there and, and also what can go wrong. And we've heard a little bit, um, you know, kind of on the edges of some testimony that we've taken in the last couple of weeks. But, you know, the concept of any public dollars that go out there to support um, broadband deployment, that, you know, that that type of asset should be an open access asset. And I think there are a lot of different ways. I don't know if there's lots, but there are different ways to define open access is something that I'm going to want to um, dig into a little bit. I think it's an interesting concept, um, but it causes me some anxiety as well. So. I so appreciate how responsive you've been to all the things that I brought to you. Mike, go ahead. Yeah, I asked a lot of questions before, but I also want you to know that I do appreciate the work you and Laura and Maria put into this uh, because uh, it's uh, quite a piece of work. Thanks. Lots to chew on. Lots to chew on here. Go ahead, Lucy. Thanks. Um, yeah, I, I really like the direction it's headed. I. As I, there, I kind of flagged a few areas that I would feel like I needed to understand better, um, either through testimony or on my own, um, depending on how much you guys did in this in past years. But um, one is- You're talking about the parts that weren't included in the Federal Telecommunications Act, Lucy? <laughs> um, <laughs> one is the VTA dormancy. I, I guess I feel a little lost on that. and would like to, if we're kind of modeling after the VTA in some sense, would like to understand more about why it became dormant and just just get more of the full picture there. Um, and then the next is the related to the tax exemption. I guess I realize that I would want to know more about how is telecommunication infrastructure taxed currently? How much, if it, if it is currently taxed, how much are we currently, um, how much revenue is that bringing into the state and local municipalities? Just more of the context in which we would be working with that. Um, and then the final piece, I, I feel a little confused about, which maybe could be this one, maybe more could be answered today. But um, just, I guess, I'm trying to track <laughs> the movement of the the movement from the public service department to the new um, community broadband authority and trying to track, you know, how much, so how many are any positions being, how many positions are being eliminated, how many positions are being added, and just kind of trying to track all that is, is a little hard through one read through. Um, and then let me see if there's more to that. 
I think the the only final thing, the only thing that kind of really stuck out to me as a hesitation is is having the community broadband authority um, run by this board. It it seemed, I guess that, that was a place that I would want to kind of look into more. It it seemed like you could run into some trouble with that as far as who, so there's three communication union district representatives essentially making the decisions of how money is allocated to all communication union districts throughout the straight state seems a little um, odd to me. And then also having the, um, you know, who are the members of the public who will be appointed? It, it seemed pretty vague, but presumably people who have expertise in broadband, but are not in state government and are not in communication union districts. So it just, I kind of am curious who those people would be. So those were, that was kind of the thing that stuck out to me. Whereas, you know, right now I realize there's issues with the way the system is set up, but at least being housed within the public service department, we know it's answerable to the commissioner and that the commissioner, you know, is there as an entity of state government to take care of Vermonters with their telecommunication needs um, more mm -hmm. formally. So that those were my big picture uh, first responses and I need to, I need to look at it more before I had any more responses than that. Great. Thank you, Lucy. Uh, Representative Aki, say like. Um, I'm going to, you know, I really, again, I really appreciate the work because we've talked about there's going to be a bill and so much work was done ahead of time. And that's why I was wondering who did it, how did it come to this level? So obviously with everybody else, thank you. Um, I'm going to say some of the things that other people have said. I too, Lucy, looked at that board and went, whoa, I've got to get more detail on that. How's that really going to work? Who are they really uh, agreed with you on that? Um, I certainly agreed with, with Catherine on being really comfortable with the, the real focus on accountability of the public money. Um, I know that's going to be. We lost you, Sally. You're muted, Sally. I just unmuted you, Sally. Oh, okay. I had <laughs> we, unmuted we, we, we me, but it, about 50, we lost you for ten seconds. Okay. Well, I was agreeing with Catherine on the the accountability of federal, you know, the state money and where all that's coming from. And then I realized that there is, you know, the question of um, of appropriations and the questions of funding. And um, I think I need to do some homework and catch up on some of those issues. Yeah, I mean, the, the funding is clearly going to be an, a, a really important thing that we're going to cogitate on. Although the governor may have made it a little bit easier today, so. Um, I'll just say, you know, as an as an editorial on this, um, as Maria was laying out, particularly the the Vermont Community um, Broadband Authority piece. Um, and, and highlighting one concept that uh, for me is critical. And it's something that um, a little bit this year, but definitely last year when we were kind of in March and April and kind of in the throes of pandemic and, you know, a little bit of panic about how do we quickly do work to accelerate um, broadband deployment. The concept of coordination um, continually came up um, of there are so many different entities um, that are affecting this marketplace, um, whether it's the CUDs, whether it's incumbent internet service providers of all different stripes, um, uh, distribution utilities playing a role, um, different types of telecom providers involved, um, different government entities at the state and federal level, and the concept of 
having a um, an entity that is um, stood up at a high level of Vermont government and has a coordinating function was something that I was hearing a real interest in uh, last spring. Um, and I, I just wanna highlight that as um, one of the kind of primary purposes of um, establishing an entity whose sole function um, is broadband deployment um, and whose function also being moved outside of the Department of Public Service, which is at its base a regulatory body um, that is now simultaneously being asked to um, stand up and support uh, really new players in this marketplace um, that are you know, potentially competing with other entities that are being regulated by that same department. And by setting this outside and having an authority that not only can coordinate, but can do so without regulating uh, with the other hand um, was an important part of the thought of um, setting this up as, um, as more independent, um, but obviously the commissioner of the Department of Public Service would still be involved as um, an important board member um, of, uh, of the CBA. So at any rate, just wanted to insert that editorial. Um, Representative Sebelia. Thank you. And uh, I'm happy to hear all the comments. Don't really, I have already spent a lot of time on this, but want to say really clearly that I don't think, I, I think that anyone who is working, uh, any entity, private, public, nonprofit, municipal, that is working on uh, broadband can benefit from the provisions in, in this bill as they're currently written. And we may change you know, a lot of these things. But at the end of the day, um, you know, as the chair said, we are not getting to the last mile and the investments that are being made now um, by our competitive for-profit um, providers for them to continue to stay competitive in the areas where people have choice, which is not my area, <laughs> um, or a lot of rural Vermont. <clears throat> um, you know, those investments that they're making oftentimes are making the situation even more expensive in the places that are uncovered. Um, so uh, <clears throat> our CUDs have, Vermonters, not our CUDs, I mean, we have 300 Vermonters that have really rushed forward with, I mean, there's a real breadth of talent and experience um, in those folks. And, uh, and especially during the COVID crisis, um, and they're volunteers, despite their talent. And they deserve, you know, they deserve our support. They have been busting it. Um, and they've brought forward plans that we told them they needed to create, right? So tell us how to do it. Here's funding to, you know, tell us how it can be done. Um, and they're doing that. They're bringing those plans forward. And the next thing is for us to figure out, okay, how do we help put together the different kinds of financing to get these to get these built you know there'll be public financing private financing philanthropic financing um, but you know asking these uh, volunteer boards on top of all of the work that they're doing and doing quickly to also you know without supports put together the financial stacks that are really needed to build out this infrastructure seems like a stretch and so uh, that when you know, the first discussions around reviving some sort of authority or entity for me <clears throat> felt like we are so, the, the urgency is so real and our need to move quickly is so, um, I, I feel re really strongly and that felt like a pretty heavy lift. But we need, we need, we need support for um, these CUDs. Um, we need additional support. It's not a knock on the department at all, not at all. Um, and, you know, the work that they've been doing is, um, I know, appreciated by those Vermonters. So I'll stop talking right there. We've been, we've heard a lot of things, but um, <clears throat> I look forward to working on this um, with all of you. And uh, Maria and Tim. So, <laughs> um, 
I've actually taken two pages of notes here. These are really good questions and things to dig into. Um, and so, I mean, this is going to inform the testimony that we prioritize. Um, we don't need to do this now. Um, and this invitation is always open, but um, between me and Laura and Heidi, we are going to work together to plan the testimony of the committee and um, always welcome input from people, um, from members of the committee as to priorities on issues that we want to hear about in this bill to dig into. Um, and, you know, I, again, in this discussion in the last uh, 15 minutes, I've, I've got a pretty good list going here. Um, so, uh, you know, definitely speak with me or send me an email or, or whatnot if you want to expand on some of your comments today um, in terms of where we want to go, you know, for areas of focus. As I'd mentioned um, earlier, tomorrow we're going to have pretty much a full morning of testimony on um, line worker workforce development. Um, on Thursday afternoon, we're going to dig into property tax exemption, um, that portion of this bill pretty deeply. Um, and um, Friday's uh, committee testimony is, is a little bit in flux right now, but I think we're gonna finish up some of the work we did last Friday on, on um, grid modernization. But um, again, I wanna be clear, this is where we're gonna be focusing our time for the foreseeable future. So please be in touch uh, you know, with, with areas that you wanna dig deeply into, but this is, a, I think, you know, the last 15 minutes has given me a real sense as to where people want to understand better, make some changes, you know, maybe there's a different focus, um, or, you know, we've just got to educate ourselves better on, on some of these things. So um, any other comments people want to add? No, good.